It's really self-sacrifice for another. Sacrificing oneself for another human being, or for the ultimate being, which is God, is the greatest source of magic. That is the source of magic, uh, which really, it, which really means just the source of connecting to the deepest reality of all. Quick disclaimer before we start, actually. Right now, we are currently enjoying a bit of British summertime. It is, in English numbers, about 25 degrees outside. A rare occurrence in this country. It's such a rare occurrence. It makes the news in this country. <laughs> That's how rare it is. Snow and summer make this headline. It affects every part of the news. So the point is, if you hear any sort of birds tweeting in the background, a lot of wind bustling by, it's not us. It's the wonderful British summertime. Now, speaking about things that are British, the idea of today's podcast sprouts out of a video you put out three months ago, but also something I know you are incredibly passionate about, which is, the title of the video was, Is Harry Potter Jewish? And you spoke for eight minutes about the links, the Jewish links, the Jewish ideas were embedded and, and brought, what's the word? Embedded. Embedded within the stories of Harry Potter. Now, no, do you explain to us your background in Harry Potter? How much of a fanatic are you? A Potterhead? Is that a pot, Potterhead or Potterhead? <laughs> <A> pot... <laughs> I can I can confirm for my viewers. I've, I am not, nor have I ever been a Potterhead. Um, <laughs> however, um, a Potter fanatic, I I have been and I am, um, and uh, it's just been with me from a very young age. I was looking through my photos from when I was younger and I found that my seven I can't remember this I couldn't remember this but my seventh birthday party I had a cake and it was a Harry Potter cake it was a picture of platform nine and three quarters so I was like wow even when I was seven I was really into it and um, the books listen to the audio books with Stephen Fry um, narrating them I remember like being on holiday and just listening to that and then the films completely uh, was captured by them um, and only recently, as I've become more interested in Judaism and Jewish learning, Jewish values, have I began to think about some of the themes, many of the themes actually within Harry Potter and how they actually chime with so many Jewish values and principles. And it's almost like J.K. Rowling knew something. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just, it's amazing. And, um, yeah, so I just kind of thought I'd do a short video about that. But to be honest, there's so much more to say. And I'm not the only one. Many people have, have noted this. Um, but the question of, is Harry Potter himself Jewish? Well, the film, the, the book doesn't specify, but the actor, Daniel Radcliffe, is Jewish. So yes, Harry Potter is Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you, uh, if you type into Google the words Harry Potter Jewish, mm. amongst up at the top is, of course, this video. But most of the initial articles... Which you can find on YouTube on JTV. <laughs> Indeed. Most of the articles, actually, she confirmed later on there was a Jewish student. I think Anthony Goldstein. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, he was both a, yeah, a well, Jew. Well, what did he do? Apparently, uh, he had a few sort of lines in the books where he disagreed with Harry. And he was in the room. <laughs> that is the most going, Jewish thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> the nudnik. I think, I think it's in book five that Harry's talking about doing the seat music going into that secret room. And it was like Anthony agreed. And then thing is this is how mad the fandom of harry potter is he has his own unique harry potter wikipedia page this guy where it had a made up like freely generated image of what he would look like hilarious it yeah it says everything like his date of birth and yeah. like his occupation and yeah i was, I was re watching a video recently about jk rowling and um i think it came from a documentary that came out when the when i think when the films were coming out at that time of uh, how she she created this whole law she created, spent five years before the first book came out creating the entire world of Harry Potter. And she says she doesn't believe that she has to put all that information inside the books, but she wants the reader to know that the author is aware of everything that's going on. So she created class lists of all the kids' names and their houses and the origins of the Dementors and all this kind of stuff. None of it you'll find in the book. None of it is, you know, public knowledge, but she created this whole amazing world. I think she said she went through 15 or 16 drafts of the first chapter and got rid of all of them because they just revealed too much. She had so much in her head she wanted to give out wow. and she wanted to kind of reserve it. Wow. But it's, um, the thing is, you'll see this a lot. She'll, I don't know how much she does it nowadays. She used to tweet quite a bit. People would, would uh, kind of go on Twitter, at JK Rowling, are there any Jewish people in Hogwarts? And then she would respond, yes, Anthony Goldstein. And she would give this whole background because it wasn't, she would make it up on the fly. As I, as I 
And when they came out, I used to think that was as such. No, she had this massive mm. sort of wealth, this uh, archive of just pot of knowledge. Wow. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that is, but I don't know how that would work. If you were a Jewish student in the world of Harry Potter, as a reader of Harry Potter, fine. But we're like, you know, to believe in Judaism and then see nearly headless Nick walk down the corridor and spells and go like, this, this wasn't in the five books of Moses. Everything is encoded within the Torah. Yeah. Everything. All of reality. So it probably isn't there somewhere we just haven't searched deep enough. <laughs> I always wondered as a kid, like just in general, what, what do the religious kids do? And they sort of, they, they grew up believing in whatever God they believed in and then magic came about. Same question of what would you do if, if, if aliens randomly landed? Like, does that, is that a massive paradigm shift or not? Maybe another podcast, by the hmm. way, another time. I well, this is one of the first, print, first points I made in um, the Harry Potter video, which is that this whole question of magic, which is really basically magic is, is like a miracle. It's basically when nature transcends its nature or goes against its nature. So that's what magic is, right? You're like, how did you do that? Because that doesn't follow the laws of nature, mm. right? That's what a magic trick is. So magic, the magical world, is um, basically where you transcend the natural order, the natural world. And so you have wizards and witches and then muggles, um, which is obviously a mushal, a, a parable for Jews and non-Jews, right? Which is Jewish people um, have... A, you know, our existence transcends the natural order. Isaac, who was born, uh, was a complete miracle because it was after Abraham and Sarah were infertile, they were in their old age, and God says, I'm going to produce for you um, a child. Um, and so the Jewish people's existence from its very start was miraculous. Our existence as a people, when we became a people, all the laws of nature were broken, the ten plagues, the splitting of the sea. We began by operating in the world of miracles, the world of magic. Mm. right um because it's the same thing basically and um then we've got these mitzvot right which are our magic tricks so to speak which is basically things we can do to transcend the natural order the natural world um which the vast majority of the world don't really know much about or they're just operating with the world of nature and our job is to really transcend the natural world and why why do we do that in order to bring that to the world to bring the transcendent to the world that's the job of the jewish people right and that's sh- so so in the end we want the magical world the wizards and witches and the muggles to all become you know uh to to meet each other and to become one with each other um and and the, you know they've each got their own job to do but they should become aware of one another you um, see that but weren't the witch- witches and wizards in harry potter they had to be secret. No, they did. They did. This, they they absolutely did. But I'm saying the point, that's where Judaism would differ. Okay. Because we want the muggles and wizards and witches to become, uh, uh, you know, one with one another. Um, you unified. You don't mean for everyone to become a, a wizard and a witch. No, but we're to become aware of magic. On... To become aware of magic. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, we want, Judaism wants, the reason why history starts off with what we call gilo panim, which means... Um, you know, God is revealed, God, the, the physical world, trans- you know, we have time of miracles, the world, trans- mm. the physical order transcends uh, into a, a non-physical and, you know, have all these plagues and miracles and sorcery and all that kind of stuff. And then we add to a time of Hester upon him where God's face is hidden. And what that really means is God, God wants to operate within the natural world. And basically the time of Moshiach, the Messiah, is when basically we see how it's all God, both the natural and the miraculous, the, the naturalism becomes miraculous. That was the story of Purim, where we saw there was not, nothing transcended nature in the story. And the rabbis intentionally didn't mention God's name in the Megillah in the book of Esther, because it's trying to say how even if you try to just operate entirely within the natural order and ignore God and not mention God, you'll see God everywhere. Um, and God wants to operate within the natural order. So when the Messiah comes, it's not going to be through any big miracle. It'll just be, it'll just be a natural occurrence. It'll be, it will be very funny because we'll just see how all these coincidences, um, you know, all kind of came together to form this perfect picture. And so that's what I'm saying in terms of, you know, non-Jews and Jews will all recognize God, but it will be through the Jewish people having, to being, having done all these transcendent things, these mitzvot throughout history, and in the end, nature and transcendent will become one and the same, and the transcendent will become one and the same. The other thing I would note as well is that what is the most powerful magic of all in the Harry Potter story? What, what saves Harry? 
uh, magical love, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Love. Spo- spoiler alert. Yeah. So, 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 <laughs> love it, it can exist everywhere. Uh, we don't need to trans. But there's it, what it's really saying is there's something transcendent about love. About it's really self-sacrifice for another, sacrificing oneself for another human being, or for the ultimate being, which is God, is the greatest source of magic. That is the source of magic, uh, which really. <laughs> It, which really means just the source of connecting to the deepest reality of all, which is to to become in to to, to expand or, or to to kind of move outside of oneself into another, and so that's the greatest. That's the magic in in Harry Potter. And J.K. Rowling actually said when she was asked about this um, in, in an interview with Oprah Winfrey, I think mm-hmm. she she said that. What what did you hear when you listened to these calls, these nine eleven calls, where people were trapped in the towers and they were speaking to their family? What were they saying? I love you. That's what the, the last thing they wanted to say to people. Love love is this transcendent uh, power, which actually all of us can 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 tap into. Jew, Jew and non Jew, <laughs> wizard and muggle, um, because that is that's the essence of transcendence is to to transcend yourself. And expand into in, into another um, another's being. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned miracles. Go and thinking about this. There is a concept of magic in Torah. The Torah prohibits one getting involved in sorcery and witchcraft. Thereby, you can imply that there's such a concept as sorcery and witchcraft. Yeah. You've got the um, on the early showdowns between Moshe, Moses, and Pharaoh. It's between his magic snakes and um, Pharaoh's magic snakes. But the way magic works, uh, as I understand it in, in, in Judaism, is that we have to understand the concept of constellations. It's how um, the way, it's, it's basically a bunch of intermediaries between God and the way things interact in this world. Yeah. It's very similar in a way to programming, the way you program a sort of a machine. Yeah. You put in a bunch of instructions and what ifs, mm-hmm. and then you set the machine off going. And, uh, and in a way, this is what the, uh, the what laws of nature are. And so there are a lot of constellations. people figure out how to manipulate those things. Well, that's the thing. Basically, so, yeah. And you hear about, you hear about uh, astrology and how people can read star signs and they can say what's going to go on in that month. Oh, I'm very big into that. So that that is also yeah. As in, I, well, I was into that mm. because it was such a revelation to me the the influence that the stars have on human the, uh, events and also. Our, our characters sure um it's just undeniable in my view it's undeniable uh people's star signs uh and the the i, I can just see you know i can i can spot a gemini from a mile away <laughs> you said it to me actually you said yeah you're a gemini aren't you it's, there yeah, you go yeah yeah um but um abraham is taken above the stars mm. at the beginning of his journey by god which is basically saying, you know, yes, there are these laws that operate within nature, the natural order, but but you, you have a relationship with me, you know, where you can transcend all that stuff. Well. So, but what was so such a revelation to me was that the the influence of the stars on uh, on us. That was like whoa, like yeah, it, it's, I, I didn't believe when I first heard it. It's, it's, a, it's a Jewish idea. I thought it was just something purely reserved for. It's not just a the, Jewish idea, it's reality. The you find in, in doctor's office, but yeah. no, it's a... Yeah. It's a genuine reality. The, yeah. the tricky thing is not that this is, this is real, but to interpret it. But I think the point is that in the same way that sorcery is forbidden, mm. God says, don't think about the stars. Be, he, the whole point is stop trying to manipulate nature. Have a relation with God and let him figure it out. Yeah, so that, that I think, is the issue with stop sorcery. Trying to mani- yeah, stop trying if to control you're, you're taking things. What's Give ready, up control. Yeah, what's already going to happen... And you're you're using whatever great wisdom and godness a person could have to, to to alter that, to change that for their own benefit, for some sort of more material gain, also as a cheat code, really. Yeah. To jump ahead in their relationship with God, but it's about the work more than just the final journey. So therefore, you don't win in the end. It doesn't work out. Mm-hmm. That's why it's in, in in small sense one of the reasons why it's prohibited. This idea. Now I don't know how we can tap into sorcery nowadays in 2021, but regardless, this is why. It's forbidden because it's, 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 it's cheating. It's cheating to gain relationship with God and it doesn't work and it's not what Hashem wants from us. He wants us to go for the ordinary ways. Yeah, by the All way, this is, this is why a lot of religious people, I think, had an opposition to Harry Potter, even though it's ridiculous. To, to this, what, the, the concern they had, I think, is ridiculous. And the concern was, 
it's encouraging sorcery. It's like, well, good luck, you know, <laughs> trying to stop people from doing sorcery. They, they, they're not, they don't know how to do sorcery. You can't I mean. learn Jewish sorcery from Harry Potter in that, in that sense, God. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what? Well, I think Abracadabra No one knows is, how to do is, sorcery. Is, if they do, I'd love, I'd be interested to know. <laughs> isn't that Avada Kedavra based on Abracadabra, which is based on Arabic? Ara- Aramaic or Hebrew or something like that? Yeah, I think it's Aramaic, abracadabra, which is like I think it's like that. What I say shall be like, do like the thing I like davar. Yeah, is both speech yeah, yeah, yeah. and a thing. I, I I'd say it written down to really sort of yeah. get my head around either. But yeah, I'm, I'm there are sources in, in such sense. Interesting though, because most of where she draws a lot of the language in Harry Potter is from the Latin language. Interesting. So um, yeah, but it, it, it sounds good, nonetheless. <laughs> Wingardium Leviosa. I'm but, not going to correct you. <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> in terms of thinking about miracles, right? So the miracles that we experience in the Torah, the open miracles, especially in the sea, they're never... Um, you've got the sea in front, you've got the Jews, and they've got the separated by the sea. Hashem, if Hashem can do anything, he can just, you know, teleport us from one side to the other side. No, the method he chooses, Hashem, is to do... to take the laws of nature and adjust them. That the sea must split in some sort of, the water must get pushed to either side. And all the miracles that we see, they seem to work within a realm of nature. As in, they, they, you, you're hijacking the norms of nature, mm-hmm. but they are working within the laws of nature. You're pushing the water aside, yeah. as opposed to... Yeah, um, which is why it says, mm. uh, God caused an easterly wind, I think it's easterly wind, yeah. to, to split the sea. So you could say, oh, it's, it just happened naturally, it was a natural event. Well, yes, but it was great timing. <laughs> 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 you know, yeah. so like God does want to operate within the natural world. But he, he wants he's, us basically he's limiting himself in verse of commas to do that. He's choosing to use the methods of the natural world yeah. to create to create the wind, so therefore he can create the splitting of the sea. I think it's As to max- just going snap fingers. It's, it's sea t- I think it's to maximize our free will because mm. you know it it can and also it becomes overwhelming when you don't have basic rules to operate within. It's just completely overwhelming, isn't it? Yeah. So basically. Um, there's a very big wasp right next to Sam. <laughs> um, basically, um, yeah, go, ev- everything could potentially be explained um, through, you know, every miracle that occurred. I think within reason could be a, at least the ten plagues and all that kind of stuff could could, I guess, be explained through through natural means, um, and that's also because again this becomes it becomes more and more quote unquote natural as you progress throughout history in like the Purim story um, but I think it's because it maximizes our opportunity as well to bring godliness into the world because for as long as things are going against nature uh, you know it's like God's doing all the work and it's just so obvious that it removes your free will. Whereas if there's basic rules of thumb, your free choice is maximized to say, do I believe that this is just a system and it, all the rules just work with, within the system? And, and I, Or is there a being outside of this system that's, you know, running the show? Okay. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? I, I, I believe so. Good. It makes sense to me, but it's making me think also of two key points that you brought up in your uh, your shorter video about an idea you can learn from Harry Potter is the unique free choice of an individual, how much an individual's actions um, uh, can can be defining. Mm. I mean, we didn't open with disclaimer or spoiler uh, warning, but there will be spoilers. Uh, Who hasn't seen all of Harry Potter? <laughs> Come on, I mean, but you can go for it. A lot of the major actions in Harry Potter the major kind of um, cornerstones of events were done by more minor characters. You've got Dobby, um, he gets killed in the end for... God, what, what does Dobby actually do? He saves Harry Potter from... From Bellatrix the Strange yeah. and Lucy, in Lucius Malfoy's house. Yeah, you've got Neville Longbottom, who is the kid who sort of teased throughout the seven books, mm. is the one who slices open the, uh, the neck of the big snake yep. to kill the... Was it the final Horcrux at that point? Yeah. You're the expert. Yeah. There we go. I mean, other than Voldemort himself. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There we go, the penultimate then. Well, no, um, because I don't think Voldemort's a Horcrux. The last Horcrux is the snake, and then... And then it ends up killing Voldemort yeah. himself. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But a lot of the key actions done in stories were done by more minor characters. 
And one of the reasons... You oh, by the way... Is, yeah. I, well, go on, finish your point. I think one of the reasons that, that J.K. Rowling chose to do that, not just because it's more maybe interesting and shocking as for a reader's point of view, because he likes to illustrate how important every single small character is to the story it makes yeah of course harry's important to the story he must be he's an, he, it's no so i just want to say something i want to i want to challenge that harry's okay. harry is so lucky <laughs> everything that ha- he is so jammy i'm what, telling you, you mean the fact that he only gets attacked at the end of the school year and he has to learn all his stuff first no no, then... no what i'm saying is just watch all the films again okay for the hundredth time <laughs> and just think about how in every single circumstance when he's in danger he just gets lucky it's all like you know, everyone else does the whole Hermione figures out so much. You know, Ron's protecting him with other times. You know, uh, his teachers. He really, and I don't know whether J.K. Rowling intentionally did this. Joe Rowling intentionally did this, but like, she she described Harry as very much just like the vessel. Yeah. You know, for the whole showdown to take place. But what does he actually do himself? You know, it's just I don't know. I, I find it quite funny to think that. Um, There's a big plot hole in Indi- one of the Indiana Jones films. Mm. Which is that if he's not there in the film, the film still happens. He affects none of the actions of the film. He's just a witness. I wouldn't say the same about Harry, but it is worth. Yeah, it's interesting that he's he he gets. And most of the books seem to end with him like in a near death situation, and then the chapter ends and he wakes up in the medical ward. I mean, how and did he survive? And, and, and Don Dumbledore's like, oh yeah, by the way, the, the, the whole you know the day was saved, and this person showed up, and that thing happened, this thing happened, and now you're alive. Yeah. And he's, how did he survive the graveyard scene? I mean, how did he survive when he's in the Ministry of Magic in book five, film five? And, uh, like, Voldemort's literally there. <laughs> he's like... Yeah, but two more books had to happen. So, you know, of course he... That... I know. <laughs> my I dad tells me the story. He went... Um... Yeah, they were married at the time. My, my, my parents went on a date uh, to see the first film. And my mum got quite scared of all the mortal danger at the end of the, of the first film. Mm. And my, my, my dad was like, don't worry. She's on book five at the moment. He lives. He makes it through... <laughs> Yeah, once you get to book seven, that it's uh, and all bets everything. Are off. Yeah, exactly. It's all the playful, but um, yeah, no, it is. It is a funny thing about Harry. He's 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 just he gets very lucky, and it's. But going back to freedom of choice, mm. um, that's also massively scattered throughout the book, and and all kinds of challenging decisions are made by mainly the central characters, sure. um, Harry and Ron particularly. Um, you know, you've got Harry, who you know. I just it's like that famous line, "Not Slytherin, not Slytherin," where he's mm. un- when he's under the Sorting Hat, and he sort of he has this connection to Voldemort, where basically both of them have greatness within them, Voldemort and Harry, and that's why I think that's the connection that they have. They both are famous. They both have, I and mean, Harry Harry only becomes famous because of Voldemort. But they're sort of like the Yetzer Hara and the Yetzer Hatov, the good inclination and the mm. bad inclination. And Harry, it's it seems to me so obvious. Like, what I what I've struggled to understand though is like, it's such an obvious choice for him to be good. It's not like what I, I they they they. She emphasised this idea that he chooses goodness, but like, was he ever going to not choose? He chooses Gryffindor. Yeah, but was he ever not going to choose that? You know, was was, more was evil fear. power tempting to him? Yeah, it's more fear, isn't it? He's he yeah he chooses good, and throughout the whole story, he's always he's a good bloke. He means well. So why would why would he? He's, he he has a level of fear, not just for the link of Voldemort that he will get put into the into the the house of Slytherin, that he will be seen in negative light. He has that fear running through. Him. Maybe is the, because the, of his greatness. You're saying perhaps. It, well, you mentioned Yates of Horror and Yates of Tov, the good and the evil inclination, and I think the Sorting Hat is a wonderful scene that illustrates that. But there's um. But I'm saying, was he ever not going to choose to be good? Well. It's, it comes up a few times in Ethics of Our Fathers, but I've seen it in a few uh, different parts of the Talmud, and it's just general, helps me the way I understand good and bad, or the inclination to good and bad, is that the greater the inclination is for evil, and the greater someone has the chance to do good, it's all, they're, they're, they're mirrored the whole time, they're best friends at the time. Yeah, One but, if, a, but if, if Harry you, represents mm. the good inclination, if there's no, no bad inclination in him. That's what I mean, if you, only, if you have no temptation to do bad, then there's very little value to one's good choices so what is harry's temptation well, you know what i could you know what you could say though that maybe he is a temptation it's not that he wants to necessarily i think this could be it it's not that he necessarily wants to do bad it's that maybe he wants to be the hero all by himself you think that possibly because 
it's like in the last film or the set, I, the, the final book, but it's one I can't remember which film it's in. He's like, no, I think it's Deathly Hallows Part One. He goes out of the Weasley's house and he's like, at night time, he's like, I'm just going to leave myself. I'm going to sort out Voldemort's the Horcruxes myself, kill them. I thought and that was um, more to save his friends and family. He didn't want. It them was. To it wrong. was. But, the, but, but people but, lost lives throughout the books. You know, yes, he's lucky. Yeah, but and maybe it's, a it's part of him. Also... He's eighteen at that point. Seventeen, eighteen. No one these a bit. But I'm saying, but terrible. maybe, maybe a part of that is also because he could be. But maybe a part of that mm. also is because he wants to be the the savior. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he just wants the glory for himself. I don't know. I mean, the truth is, you're right. Like he just, he's. I think it's, it's all coming from a good place. Like think about him. He's just like. He's so forgiving of people, mm. like, there's on numerous occasions, whether it's so- saving Draco Malfoy or whether it's saving um, Peter Pettigrew. He's just very forgiving and good. So, like, this whole thing of... I, I know she, J.K. Rowling is trying to teach this principle of freedom of choice when he's under the sorting hat, but my question is, did he really have a choice there? That's, he still has to exercise some action in that moment. Mm. You're right, you say uh, the, it was always, he was always going to end up in the House of Gryffindor, but... He started to go through that internal battle inside and made What's the battle? Difference. I don't know. I'm also thinking about, and especially that comes across in the first few books, he lives his first 10, 11 years of his life as a neglected young kid, yeah. a sort of rejected, unwanted child in Dursley's 10 house. years, 10 years. 10 years, okay. Because the first year he's happy with his parents. Fine. Okay, fine. But he has that, that childhood. Yeah. And then, and he's unaware of the magic world and unaware what happened to him. Yeah. And then Hagrid shows up and, you know, and whenever they mention his name, oh, it's, this is the boy, this is Harry Potter. Yeah, it's the overwhelming. Boy who lived. Yeah. He gets his level of fame. He's in, and he's aware of this. He's done nothing to achieve that at that point. <laughs> we know what's going on, but like he's, there's no action, no level of Bahira free will that has given him any sort of yeah. value at that point. He is purely just the result of the actions. Yeah. The fact that it's more his mother than anything else, but she's there. It's his mother. It's his mother. He just happens to be there, right? So many other kids have got wiped away by Voldemort. He's happened to be the one who lived. Yeah. And so he has this level of fame. And there's a point, I mean, I know it's in the film, I don't know if it's in the books as well, where he's trying to get a date. And he goes, of course you go out with me. I'm, I'm the chosen one. And her mind just whacks him on the, the top of the head. Yeah. But like, yeah, he, so he starts to believe it at times. He's given this no, but he, fame he, status he, of... He says that tongue-in-cheek. You know, <laughs> but he's had this status of... This, cause the whole way through, he's quite moral. I just know, I don't think he's an egocentric guy. He's not. And he, there maybe there's a level of guilt there. That he didn't... Um, he never earned this level of fame. And he's got to justify it. So well, isn't that the beauty of love? You end up doing things for people who might not deserve it. But because, you, you know, love is not about deserve. Well, maybe that's what fuels a lot of his good will nature. He knows that he doesn't deserve this fame and applause and sort of status. Yeah. Therefore, he, when he sees someone like Dobby, who is being, you know, literally an elf, literally being neglected in the way he's treated as well, and he, he meets Dobby and treats Dobby like a, a person, or yeah. like, like someone of value and not just staff. Yeah, yeah, it's entirely... It makes sense to him because yeah. he's been through that battle. It's similar if you want to go back to sort of... Um, why, one of the major questions I've always wondered, and I, I've listened to answers of, is why did the Jews have to go, undergo slavery mm. before receiving the Torah? Mm-hmm. It's an essential part of the Jewish journey. Why was that? And that, that's clear to me. What was the lesson gained there? What were the lessons gained that made it essential? So I, I want to say a couple of things. Okay. The first thing I want to say is that um, in terms of this whole deserving thing, he didn't do anything to deserve it. He didn't do anything wrong either, by the way. It's not like he... No, he did anything wrong. He but, knew that he did something but, wrong. But, but one thing... That, false faith. So the first point I wanted to make is that sometimes, well, throughout history, because people did things in the past, other people can benefit from that. There's a great story of um, someone that went to the Hobbit time, and I can't remember the backstory to it or what, what he was getting at or why he said this to this person. But he basically said... I, I don't remember whether he, he was a Cohen. I think he was a Cohen, or a Levy. I think he was a Cohen, and he said because my ancestors in Egypt. Oh, was, the Chovetz Chaim was a Cohen. Yes. The Chovetz Chaim said this to a person. Said because my ancestors, yeah. Because my ancestors in Egypt refused to worship that golden calf, for that reason, I will be a priest in the high temple in the future. In, in, in the temple in the future. Mm. And that, first of all, I think is related here. Because of the actions of the past give merit to people. So it might so they 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 benefit off what their ancestors 
uh, sort of achieved. It's one of the reasons we invoke uh, our forefathers and the first blessing of the of the Amida. Yeah. If you want to say we're not just, you know, God is not just our God, yeah. you and me, but he's the God of our forefathers yeah. and we're trying to invoke that and by, merit. And by the way, we're... we're learn things for ourselves. Yeah, and we are, I'm sure, Harry's people. mother in heaven... Mm. It was her greatest pleasure to see her son, you know, get, gain all this wonderful uh, reward. Um, the second thing I'd say is that you say, what did Harry deserve it? Don't forget, though, he did go through 10 years of terrible uh, suffering, trauma and, and abuse. Okay. So there is also a principle that one of the merit, one of the ways in which you gain merit is through good deeds and good actions. But another way is through suffering. Now, so, so he did, you know, he suffered for 10 years. Don't forget that. But there's a, a question related to that, which you asked, which is why did the Jewish people need to go through suffering? Why did God design the world this way? It's a great question. Why did God have to design the world in a way where, where sometimes suffering needs to occur? It's, a, we don't, it's, a, it's the same question comes to people all the time. It's just, it's very easy to look at it with a non motive non-personal point of view when it comes to the jews in egypt because we we didn't go through that suffering ourselves yeah you and me but people have this as well why did i have to have my own this this hardship this suffering in my life yeah it's like uh it's, it's difficult to try and tackle it head-on especially with an actual case but it's a, it's a it's a point of thinking that's very important yeah it's like that great uh like we can laugh at, it's not laugh about it but like we're more detached from it now it's like this hilarious family guy uh scene where uh you've got the Jews in ancient Egypt and they're like carrying all these bricks and mortar and one Jew says to another, look, every nation has its trials and tribulations at the start before they're formed. But don't worry, after this uh, slavery, it's just going to be smooth sailing from here on out. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Now, why did God create the world in which he has to create a vessel first in order to create the goodness? It's the same reason he creates light and he creates darkness. And then, by the way, the darkness was a thing. We think of darkness as an absence of light. But there at the beginning, the darkness was actually a thing. And so when darkness and light fused together, he said he separated the light and the darkness. So what does it mean before that? that they? What does it mean separated them? Like either there's light or there's darkness. The darkness there was an actual entity. And so when the light was there, the light and the darkness was mixed together. And God um, said that, that, that this has to be saved for later in history. So for now, light and darkness have to be separate. Which means that the way in which the world operates now until the next world, um, meaning the future, um, is where good experiences and bad experiences have to be separate things. But in the future, we'll see how the light and the darkness will mix together to fuse one whole. We'll see how both the bad and the good were for an, a greater ultimate purpose. That's an even, even greater good, as the say, you know, to coin a phrase, um, is better than the goodness on its own. Yeah. It's one right. way you can sort of understand how it came to be. Well, first of all, where does evil, the concept of evil and badness come from? And yeah, if everything comes from Hashem, therefore evil and badness came from Hashem, how could God create, does it fit in our definition of Hashem? to create evil but if you look at this evil and this badness as really a necessary evil but a necessity for the overall you know needs of life Mm. then it's 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 a hard it's an easier question to tackle yeah because why did god create such necessary challenges all of a sudden yeah by the way one of the explanations given for why they had the the jews had to go through the slavery in egypt was because god wanted us to become entirely and utterly devoted and in love with him and utterly devoted to his uh his his desire and his will the torah throughout history even when it got really tough and challenging to totally stick to it and so therefore he placed us in a slavery where we became totally committed to almost enslaved to a a it was a tyrannical regime but we were completely and utterly uh enslaved to it and and focused on it day and night and that sort of created the vessel, so to speak, for us to become a servants of God. Because we had nothing right? of our own beforehand. Exactly. The, the exactly. Egyptians stripped us of any sense to, of 
thought of, of independence. Exactly, and that's why when Moses comes back to redeem the Jewish, to the Jewish people, um, Pharaoh immediately makes their work much harder and gets rid of their day off because now maybe they will start to think about something else than enslavement to, to Pharaoh. Maybe they'll start to think of it, get ideas of redemption, rebellion. Ide- ideas about their station. Exactly, and therefore we can't allow that, and therefore we have to make them become even more enslaved to the Egyptian regime. But of course, and that's why they all were like Moses, like go away, like what are you doing? They're making it worse. <laughs> exactly, which, by the way, is another principle mm. that's usually in the the final stages of uh, a challenge. It's like you can get uh, the most painful before eventually it turns on its head. It's like it's like childbirth, I the mean... birth pangs. <laughs> You look at me like, like you know, you know Charba. I'm like, we don't know Charba. But yes, but I mean, people the, can. I apparently men can uh, give birth these days. I don't know. That's what. They're, that's they're, what I'm being told. It's, it's, it's a whole talk on the thing. Um, no, they're, they're meant to be machines that create such pain, uh, so men can understand it. Um, Honestly, I, I, I don't. Out, yeah, I, I'm. But, I don't really have <laughs> I'm too I much of a wimp as it is. The, the idea of it can be the hardest before the end and you achieve what you're trying to do for sure yeah just to like squeeze out the final uh, yeah. potential before the vessel is finally ready <laughs> okay but changing the topic entirely away from childbirth um tell me what, what other key ideas do you think are poignant between Harry Potter and Judaism things that we can really take um there's plenty uh we can talk about so many more but one thing that comes to mind um that I didn't talk about in my JTV video um was the issue of jealousy um that is the root issue if you read the torah between human beings and other human beings it's it animates every single generational issue between abraham's descendants Mm. you know whether it's isaac and ishmael jacob and esau um, the brothers and Joseph, it's always jealousy, and with, with other women as well, jealousy, 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 jealousy. Um, that, by the way, is the root of anti-Semitism. People saying, hey, what's so special about the Jews, you know? Um, and that, by the way, is why, we'll get to this in a second, why jealousy is spoken about on two occasions in the Ten Commandments. This is such a fundamental part of Jewish um, thinking. But jealousy... Where do we see jealousy mainly in in uh, the Torah? It's it's with Ron. Yeah, in, within Harry Potter. Within Harry Potter, yeah. Ron yeah. is at times. Is what's this is what's fascinating about Ron. He he is plagued by jealousy from time to time. Mm-hmm. Sometimes bet- to Hermione because he wants Hermione and has a deep. But although Hermione also has jealousy for Ron sometimes. Mm. Um, but he's also jealous of at times of Harry, but it's most manifest most in the Goblet of Fire. Do you remember where like Harry gets the um, the Triwizard Cup, and he's, he's living it up, and Ron's yeah, just there. Well, at if the you're sides. Harry, i poor guy. He's terrified. He's like, I didn't choose this. I didn't ask for this. He didn't put his name in the, the Goblet of Fire. Sorry, as Dumbledore asked calmly. Yeah. Um, yeah, he didn't put his name in the Goblet, and he didn't. And then Ron's like, Yeah, you did. I bet you did. And um, but what's yeah. also hilarious about Ron and why he's so lovable mm. is that even when he's plagued by jealousy, and don't forget, so much of our challenges and trials are imposed upon us. So you know, that's I'm not blame. It's the jealousy isn't necessarily from within him. It's just something he has to struggle with because it's for whatever reason something that's been placed upon his shoulders. Um, and what I'm saying is we're not, we don't choose how we're designed. Um, and, but what's, what's so lovable about Ron is that even the times where he does feel these sense of jealousy or feeling torn, he still helps out Harry. Yeah. You know, cause I'll never, I love that scene where after Harry and Ron aren't talking in, in the Goblet of Fire, he gets a message, gets Hermione to send a message that Hagrid's looking for him in the forest so that Harry can know that dragons are the, f- was it the first? task yeah the first task so even then even when he's played by jealousy he cannot help he's but be a good friend by jealousy. He's, he's not defined by jealousy and in the end and in the end when when he sees that vision of harry and hermione um yeah kissing um 
he slaughters it. He slaughters the jealousy that was within him. Well, that's the interpreter. Yeah, that's I think so. Yeah, yeah. He's slaughtering the god of jealousy. Now, jealousy in the Torah, um, God introduced himself to us at Mount Sinai. And this is why we had such a, it was such an incredible experience. He says, I'm the Lord your God. You took that land of Egypt. Don't have other gods. Don't worship other gods. Worship me. Why? Because I'm a jealous God. That's what he says. It's very interesting. Jealous. It's very be- interesting and hard to understand. So, yeah. And what it means is he deeply desires us. That's like, whoa. Like, no wonder they were like, their souls flew up to heaven when they, when they heard that from God. Because it's like, God, that means God wants us. Like, he, like as, 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 as you experience that jealousy where you really want what the other person has, he really wants us. Which is like, whoa. And then the tenth commandment is don't be jealous. No, no, don't you human beings think you can have jealousy? That, that's, that's stupid. I want you. Don't think you want other things. The only person, I, the only being I want you to want is me. And don't worry, I'll give you everything you need. I'll, I'll take care of all your needs. So stop, don't, don't be so stupid as to be seeking after other things that, that isn't yours. And also you get excited by the fact that God is jealous of you and he wants you. Like, <laughs> is that not enough? <laughs> that's yeah. awesome there's a lot of parallels between jealousy and arrogance and also idol worship yeah uh within the time yeah they've got, they've got says don't worship other gods i'm yeah. a jealous god meaning so idol worship is having an affair with with another god sure not that they exist but it's like it's like having it's so to speak having an affair mm. but it's the kind of idea of how um it's the line in the, in the gemara of sota that i believe if i'm quoting correctly that arrogance is seen as worse as idol worship which is surprising just the concept of arrogance because we have the Ten Commandments we know idol worship is a is a major major sin and arrogance just seems to be a, a, a poor personality trait but it's, it's if you understand deep a little bit deeper of where arrogance comes from and jealousy the same it's a battle between expectation and reality if a person has a high expectation for themselves they believe that they deserve and are worthy of the higher claim um, and then they'll walk around, sort of, trying to expect it. And they'll have an arrogant uh, personality. Because they... And the reason it is arrogant is because it's above their station. It's, be- it's above the actual reality. And jealousy can come is when you believe that you are worthy of this high stature. And you're not receiving it. Or you see other people are getting it. People don't often... Or maybe some people do. People uh, rarely get jealous by someone else achieving. If they fully buy into why the person got it and why they don't have it themselves. I'm not walking around and I'm constantly jealous of Bill Gates' wealth because it's a whole different story in itself how he got there. It's not like we, you know, trained together, um, went same studies together, and now he's Bill right. Gates and I'm. But you're jealous of your neighbour or your friend or your not you, but one is. It's a far greater challenge. Things that are more to, to battle yeah. jealousy when things are more attainable yeah. and real because I can say, yeah, I, I should have got that prize, I should have got that that achievement, I should have got mentioned by that guy, yeah, and I'm not getting it, and that's where the real battle is. Yeah. And I think I think arrogance is considered a form of idolatry because idolatry is worshiping other god, uh, worshiping other powers other than yeah. God. And arrogance is worshiping, which and it's all it's all it's all falsehood. Yeah. It's just all arrogance, yourself. Yeah, arrogance is worshiping yourself, which is also uh, really um, a falsehood because uh, you know. <laughs> The only ultimate being is God. Mm. And so we are only here at his, uh, because he wills us into existence. And so to think that we are the center of existence or that other gods are the center of existence basically crams out God from the picture. And idolatry is cramming out God, having an affair, worshiping other forces, thinking there are other forces out there other than god himself so whether you think you are the force or you are the center of existence or whether you think other powers are the center of existence and by the way idolatry is whatever you make the center of your life if it's not god then that's could be idolatry well it is idolatry in one form or another if if you think being a um jk rowling said i I saw i heard her say that she wanted to create a world for fanatics and she wanted to um, as part of why she made a massive law you want to sort of um, create a culture, a, a, a book where fanatics get obsessed with. People do get very obsessed and very involved in works of fiction. Mm. 
and they devote a lot of their time and their resources and their money and just their, their mental capacity dwelling on just fictional premises mm. and like I mean the entertainment industry is meant to be primarily entertainment and entertainment in someone's life can often be used as sort of to ease off pressure and to relax and to whoever said not to not to engage with the world the point is whether it's the means or the end so mm. every god wants us to enjoy everything about uh the world it's just about is this a means or an end so do you treat your football team as just a way of relaxing having fun or is that the end is that your god so God expresses himself and we can learn about him throughout everything in the world. But the question is, are we engaging with the world in order to have a better relationship with him? And sometimes that can mean pausing and taking a step back from thinking about him, if it's still the ultimate purpose. Um, Or um, is it to, um, you know, is it not for that reason? Um, So that's basically the choice. It's never about withdrawing from the world. So Harry Potter can be in order to relax and not f- not to become your the thing you are devote your entire life to. Um, it can just be used as a way to learn about certain values, as we're doing right now, and think about certain values and principles and see how they chime with God's will and values, and also just to entertain ourselves and relax. And you know, um, that man needs rest. Man needs rest. To, be, to, to achieve it at its best at the same time. Um, yeah. yeah, and so that's basically, um, I think, the way the way to go. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, drawing back to the idea of jealousy and someone sort of believing that or what they've been given by God isn't, isn't fair, it often, I think it negates the idea that everyone has their place, everyone has their purpose. And this is also seen quite clearly throughout Harry Potter. I mentioned a bit earlier about the minor characters being involved and not just being sort of, you know, background for Harry's greatness. They're, they, uh, they have a place to play. But they, and you also mentioned about Harry being so lucky. I think they all, not different characters, they, uh, they educate Harry about key ideas that he wouldn't have got there himself. Yeah. Even Snape, in, in, when he's, again, spoiler alerts, before he turns, uh, we find out to be him to be good at the end. A lot of his, um, the antagonism of Snape is very beneficial to Harry. At yeah, times. and he and it, it, it's necessary, and he learns lessons throughout of how to become yeah. with a better wizard, but also just a, a better all-rounded person and hero ultimately. Mm. I think part of the point is that with everyone having their role, if you're doing, you are designed to f- fulfill a role. Mm-hmm. If you're doing the job you're designed to do, you will be happy. So a cow is designed to be a cow. A cow is happy being a cow. <laughs> <laughs> and a plant is happy being a plant and sam kaufman if he you should you know figure out what you're good at what you enjoy and use that to be of service to the world you will be happy so we all have been designed you know god is so to speak the jk rowling um <laughs> who has given us all cast us all with a certain role to play and if you do that if you do the role you're going to be happy yeah. and you're going to play your part in the tapestry of creation. I, I was thinking that. To, I was thinking about the fact that she has this much knowledge on Harry Potter that doesn't see the light of day. I don't want to say that she's God because that's quite a scary, <laughs> funny thing to say. But in, in the world of Harry Potter, she plays it like that because she is the, the key holder. She knows, all, she knows what will be. What I'm saying is God is the author yeah. of humanity. I often think about when people ask the, uh, the famous question, which is how can we have free will if God knows what we're going to choose? Mm. But it's a bit like the, a, a, an author of a book in a way, where J.K. Rowling, when she wrote book one, knew roughly what was going to happen in book seven. And yet, in the eyes of the characters in, in book one, if they take it to be, then to be real, they have free will, they have choice, they are making choices. Yeah, I think the way it works in real life is God God makes clear and set in stone the ending Mm. but we all have a job to do but we can choose whether or not we're going to do that job uh, and and how we do the job that's sort of the the area of free will otherwise our free will is meaningless well we only have free will in certain areas Um, okay yeah 
physical you know, limitations we can't fly even if we were no but like whether you're going to drink that tea or not you know you're oh, okay. it's, it's it's based on how you that's not there that, are levels of free that's will. entirely deterministic sure um our only free will is whether we choose to love or hate others and love or hate gods that's basically only where the free will lies and we all know those times where we feel like there's that we could either go left or right we could <laughs> do good or bad like we know the free will is there um and yeah so so i think that's part of the reason why what, what it meant from tra- going from the desert into the land of israel what it meant was and why there was such resistance to it with the spies is in the desert it was easy you know we all just were totally taken care of and you know we're totally just receiving god's um um benevolence and the idea of going to the land of israel is okay take that faith take that you know that 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 trust you have in god and now you 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 lead the way you know you you make something of the world you you build up and you operate within the natural laws and play your role that way um which is why we talk about god as our shepherd the shepherd leads from behind shepherds at the at the back just just making sure everyone's good and and, and actually directs in some ways from behind but we we lead the way and so god gives us our role god god designs us in a certain way and we in some respects can can build our own forge our own our own uh roadmap basically and and, and make choices that are our, are our own mm. um so and we're, so we're not designed the Torah is very clear that we're not designed uh, to be a people just given things and just to live as such so we have got when we receive the manna in the desert yeah this daily supply of foods eventually the Jews start to complain about the manna it's not good enough they want more it was better in Egypt they they, they confuse themselves with this idea mm-hmm. you've got uh, the rebellion of Korach where he uh, attacks the hierarchy of, of Moses and Aaron and questions that You've got the sin of the golden calf. They do a lot of um, things when they're in this privileged state. They're not earning what they're what they're what they're doing. They're given free food and sort of free divine attention and, and help from God, and they almost get spoiled because the overall goal of that journey is not to live in a desert in this funny state, but to receive the land, to work on the land of Israel, to be a Jewish nation. Mm. We, and to you know to work in we have a, we get a temple at the end of it to sort of to work in that world where we're doing our own other da our own work yeah and making it our own i think the best principle of this idea that god determines how the end the ending or where history must end up but we get to choose how our role manifests mm. and sort of which how, how our character manifests in the story um and the great example of that is when mordechai says to esther before she goes into the, to the potentially gets killed by going mm. into the king's chambers, and tells her tells him about the plot to kill Haman's plot to kill the Jews, to save the Jews, Mordecai says help will come for the Jews one way or another because it has to because God has to protect the Jews for the sake of human history. Um, but the question is, do you want to be the the um, agent that that creates? the mm. ultimate salvation for the jews because if you don't then okay then you won't you will not be the one that played that role but it will happen god will just find another way so do you want to play the role yes or no yeah so again the plot ending is clear but we get to choose how our role manifests okay the last thing i want to ask you about i've been thinking about this as well is the role of leadership um, in Harry Potter, at the start, Dumbledore is the clear leader. He's in terms of, he's the mentor to Harry, and he's often guiding, and often seems to know more than he gives on about the challenges Harry's meant to face. By the end, especially after, again, spoiler alert, after Dumbledore dies in the end of book six, Harry he struggles with it, has to take over this this role of being the leader of the battle against Dumbledore, oh, against Voldemort, sorry. And um, but there are there are themes between them between Harry and Dumbledore, maybe things that Harry learns and gains off Dumbledore, especially with regards to his, um, his kindness, his kind nature. Dumbledore was always very kind and polite and treated everyone with respect. And likewise, so does Harry, he followed suits from every sort of you know, major uh, person in the Ministry of Magic to a simple house elf. And Dumbledore had the respect of creatures that seemed to hate the wizards. You know, the centaurs seemed to have quite an abrasive attitude to 
Harry and his, his mates, but have a level of respect for Dumbledore. Even you say Voldemort has a level of respect to Dumbledore as well. But and I think it's earned due to this kindness. So I mean, and the idea of, 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 of leadership and leadership skills that can be taken from Harry Potter is also quite quite key. And what, what would you make of that? Yeah, I agree. Uh, we're told that um, Moses, who was the greatest leader of the Jewish people, greatest leader of all time, mm. was the most humble man ever to exist. It's always I've always found it so uh, curious how when God tells Moses, "You're the man. I need you to lead the Jewish people out," and he's like, eh, "You can find someone better than me." <laughs> Which is so curious. It's so interesting how why he says that. I had a fa- fascinating um, uh, explanation um, or a, a kind of approach to this matter by Rabbi David Foreman, who said that one of his issues wasn't anything a logical reason, uh, but that he was emotionally uncomfortable with the fact that he'd be confronting the person he always considered his brother. You know, and that's very awkward. Wow. Right, he's confronting the person he thought was his brother and saying, "I'm with the Jews, not with you, who have been enslaving that people." Which is very uncomfortable. Which is why, when he runs out of logical arguments and he's just saying, "Please don't choose me," God says, "Isn't Aaron your brother? You know, we, maybe we could use him for something." But he's sort of saying, "Aaron's really your brother." Um, so, anyway, that's just a bit of a side point, <laughs> but. Um, that's also an issue of to like split loyalties and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we can, you know, is 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 Moses a Jew? Is he a member of humanity? Is he Egyptian? All these kind of questions. There are a lot um, of similarities, especially at the start of their story between Harry and Moshe in terms of Moshe re- initially refused. Harry didn't want to accept this big role of being the boy who lived in this great level of fame and responsibility. I'm not sure if he didn't want to accept it. He was just baffled by it. Sure. Dazzled by it. I'm sure like some kids uh, aged 10, if they're told you're the next big thing, will race towards that, seek it out. Mm. He doesn't he's a bit, yeah, he's, he's a, a bit, bit shocked and scared. Yeah. 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 Um, so... I think he likes the uh, his friends, Hermione, especially Hermione. He doesn't... She came into this... It may start in the first book. She's a, a complete muggle. She, a, a family. She doesn't know about the wizarding world. So she has to learn later on about... Uh, this Harry Potter character mm. and the history around him. Yeah. So when she meets him the first time, it's, he's just really a kid. Yeah. And everyone's, it's quite like a genuine relationship. Ron's aware, but it still they, they, it, it develops a gen, sort of genuine brotherly friendship as well. Yeah. Although the, uh, the jealousy that we've mentioned. But just going back to this matter of humility mm. and leadership, um, the Talmud says that you should have two sayings in each of your pockets. One that says the world was created for me and the other one says I'm but dust and from dust I came into dust I shall return. That on the one hand I am here because God needs me and I play a a critical role, a unique role that only I can fulfill on the story of human history and and, and fulfill a need that that God God has, a divine need, an infinite need, which is like, whoa, is there anything greater than that? But on the other hand... I'm but dust and ashes. I could be willed out of... I was willed into existence. I could be willed out of existence at any moment. Which I'm entirely dependent on God. Mm. So that's like... I mean, talk about bipolar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, it's like... I. So, like, you can trust that you're going to keep existing because God needs you. But on the other hand, like, he created you so he could will you out of existence at any moment. And that's... So. So it's like... Golda Meir had this great line where she said to someone, don't be so humble, you're not that great. <laughs> and we think that humility means saying, I'm nothing, I'm a nothing. Well, we're a nothing only to the extent that we could be willed out of existence at any moment. But the point is, we are here because God needs us here, because he wants us to have a relationship with him. So I heard a great line um, by Rabbi Friedman who said Manus Friedman who said humility doesn't mean I'm nothing humility means you're everything which means I'm not a nothing because you want me here but the point is you want me here and therefore I'm all yours 
I give myself over to you. And so I, rec I humble my existence by recognizing that I'm only here because you want me here. So for as long as you want me here, I'm all yours. And so no, I'm not a nothing. There's a divine need for me. But I, I'm therefore going to give myself over to God and therefore I'm humble because of that recognition that I'm really just, as I say, just a product of God's need. Yeah. I could end on that, by the way. <laughs> or I could just be arrogant and try and shove in the last word. <laughs> if you have something good to say, then uh, then say it. It's not arrogance. Um, no, what I will say on that, and you're right, humility is not just to think of someone as or yourself as nothing when you're not. A great person who, who thinks themselves to be uh, worthless as a human being is, is just acting ignorantly. Yeah, it's just annoying to God. Yeah. It's like annoying, like, no, <laughs> you're, not, you're not nothing. You've got a job to do. Stop being so annoying. <laughs> so perhaps the start of Harry's journey, you can look at it as he's aware he's not done much at that moment, if anything, to warrant this level of fame and status. Mm. Mm. And throughout his, his seven years in school, for the most part, he said he's lucky, he gets by, he has these battles come to him and happens to be that magic trait that he learned earlier that year that ends up saving the day at the very end. Only by the end, after Dumbledore goes away, he has to really realise that it does fall down to him. With all he knows about the Horcruxes, he has his actual, his personal responsibility in the battle against evil, in the battle against, um, in, yes. against Voldemort. And he has a few tribulations at the end to go alone, though he needs his friends, he wants to save his friends, no, but he needs to do it with them, he has to learn that, that level of maturity. And at the very end, yet then he defeats Voldemort. He actually is the one responsible. Or, or he leads the, the team to be responsible. He leads the army against uh, Voldemort. He earns this level of greatness. He actually earns this statue, this fame, because he's doing something. And he's comfortable with himself to, to lead. He's comfortable because he understands it has to be done. He sees his purpose. He sees his role. And he sees it has to be done. That's a... If you want to look at sort of the arc that he goes through all, all seven books, he goes from a almost a hum humble, un someone to be unworthy uh, person to... Uh, someone who deserves to lead. Same with the Jewish people go from the, lo the penultimate level of, um, of tumor, of impurity, after being slaves. Mm. They are completely unworthy in their own eyes. They have no merit of themselves. And then they have to go up that journey to receive the Torah, to become this light unto the nations, to become the nation close to a God with responsibility to be as close and in touch with their creator. Mm -hmm. And at some point along the line, we have to develop that maturity and that pride to take ownership over that and actually to be understand our purpose as a Jew not to be ashamed of it to be proud of it and to act correctly within that beautiful thank you for joining us today and listening to JTV podcasts you can buy more podcasts from JTV including interviews with Rabbi Manus Friedman Dennis Prager Rabbi Dr. Akiva Tatz and many more available on Apple Podcasts Spotify and Google Podcasts just search for JTV Podcasts with Ollie Hannesfeld don't forget to subscribe on the JTV YouTube channel for hundreds of videos on Jewish philosophy Israel Jewish wisdom and much much more please consider supporting us so we can continue to grow just visit paypal.me forward slash JTV channel Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.